Good afternoon, I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer, here at the Law & Crime Report. We begin the report with the death of a CEO tech uh, by the name of Fahim Saleh. Now, he was found dead and dismembered, and he's being uh, allegedly Tyrese Haspel. His 21-year-old uh, assistant is being accused of murdering him and dismembering him. Let's take a listen to the NYPD chief who gave out the report of this arrest. At approximately 8.45 this morning, 21-year-old Tyrese Haspel, H-A-S-P-I-L, was taken into custody in the lobby of 172 Crosby Street by members of the New York, New Jersey Regional Fugitive Task Force and transported to the 7th Precinct for arrest processing. On Tuesday, July 14th, Mr. Fahim Salih's cousin discovered his dismembered body in the living room of his apartment with his head, arms, and legs amputated. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that on Monday, July 13th, at approximately 1.45 p.m., Mr. Salih was assaulted by Mr. Haspel with what appears to be a conductive energy weapon, better known as a taser, while exiting an elevator into his apartment. If I could just explain that real quickly, the way this building is set up, when you go up in the elevator, it takes you right to your, right to your apartment and not into a hallway. Due to the active and ongoing investigation, I will not get into the actual cause of death. The extensive investigation led by the 7th Precinct Detective Squad Manhattan South Homicide identified the perpetrator in less than three days and revealed that Mr. Haspel was Mr. Salee's executive assistant and handled his finances and personal matters. It is also believed that he owed the victim a significant amount of money. All right, so this might be a case that we're used to when it comes to Long Crime Trial Network, but not so much in New York. Adam, your initial response when you heard about this tech CEO case? Well, you know, it's tough because my initial response was really coupled with the fact that they had Mr. Haspel on video at Home Depot buying the saw and some cleaning products that seemed to be found in the apartment. Uh, it, it's, it's tricky because this seems like a financial crime gone horribly, horribly wrong. And so the argument of, well, $50,000, although is a significant amount of money, is it enough to push a young man to murder? Um, but it doesn't look great for Mr. Haspel. Julie Rendell, and same question. It, it, the, their motive seems to be unclear. It seems to be that he owed him a lot of money. Some of the articles that we're reading and some of the reports are saying there was a repayment program, uh, which seems peculiar, peculiar to murder someone for that. But so far, all fingers are pointing towards uh, the defendant here. Yeah, we were talking about this um, before we came back on, and I said, you, you know, we always say, to, you know, something to our clients, please, whatever you do, do not speak to investigators, do not talk under any condition. And I think the second thing I think we've come up with is that whatever you do, and I, I don't mean to be, um, you know, you know, flip about this, but it's unreal how many cases we've seen um, on long crime where an individual is caught either before or after the crime going to a hardware store to either get bleach to dispose of the evidence, get some type of saw, anything. It, it's unbelievable to me that they are, are caught so red-handed and don't understand that this is going to define what this case is. And that, to me, is going to be the thing that basically um, points only in the direction of this defendant and nobody else. All right. It's going to be a tough case. Of course, the defendant, Tyrese Haspel, is claiming that he is not guilty of the charges of first and second degree murder, along with grand larceny, concealment of a body, and burglary in the second degree. Let's shift gears to the Kelsey Thomas retrial. It started yesterday. We heard testimony from the state's medical examiner, as well as two other witnesses. But let's begin with the medical examiner talking about the injuries that she saw on the victim, being five-year-old Chloe. And in what form of strangulation do you expect to see this type of hemorrhage? A strangulation where there is 
displacement of the tissue, usually with a force that is moving. So there is um, compression with movement um, or significant pressure over a small surface area. So I would expect to see hemorrhage, for instance, if strangulation occurred because of a heavy object with a short, small surface area, like a bar over the neck, I would expect the hemorrhage if there's movement, such as would occur with um, a struggle or friction applied. But again, although you can see a little hemorrhage in a hang, probably associated with the ligature slipping a bit or um, move in a slight amount, you can see it on both sides of the neck, you can see it at various levels, and you can see it in a child are all unusual, unexpected. All right, so let's let, let's talk about more of those cases, Adam. This is an interesting situation where it started off as a jury trial. They've got, I think the defense got somewhat of a favorable uh, disposition and hung on the top charge right. and then dismissal on the lower. Now we're going bench trial. Talk to us about this case in terms of the wisdom of moving towards a bench trial or lack thereof, depending on your thoughts. Well, sure. Uh, I think it's, it's rare to do a bench trial, period. Uh, it's, it's way more common, and I'm talking 95% of the time you would choose a jury trial. There are circumstances that sort of Julie alluded to earlier or sometimes you get what's called like the wink and the nod from a judge. Like, oh, are you sure you don't want to go bench on this one? I've had that happen before. And when that's happened, I said, you know what, judge, I think I do want to go bench. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I was, got an acquittal. Uh, but that doesn't happen very often. And what's important to take into account, too, this is a retrial, not just a trial. So on a retrial, it's even harder to get an acquittal because the prosecution will see what worked and what didn't in the first trial, and they can sort of shore up any sort of holes that they that they had left out there in the first trial. So, you know, I think this is a combination of the fact that they the, the defense feels like their only avenue for an acquittal here is a very legal focused one, meaning that this absolutely just does not fit the definition of murder uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so they think that they have a better shot of appealing to a judge's legal standard of, of proof versus what a jury might do. Um, but it's a risky decision, and it's one that does not happen very often. Yeah, it, it, Adam, it makes perfect sense the way you're putting it. It sounds like more of a technical argument than maybe a stylistic one that you might present to a jury. Uh, Julie, what do you think of this idea of, hey, just zoom in on this technical issue of burden of proof? There's reasonable doubt here. I understand it's a horrible case where a five-year-old died, and you've kind of put your eggs in this bench trial basket. Uh, again, you know, we, we you know, it. it it would really depend on who the judge is. I, I've had one murder case where, um, when I was a prosecutor, where the defense went bench. And the reason they went bench is because the judge was the most liberal judge in the courthouse. Everyone knew it, and so that they were going to take their chances on that because the case was pretty overwhelming. Um, the one thing I think is interesting in this case is, you know, Adam says that it's better for the prosecution because they get that second bite at the apple. Well, it's also good for the defense. They get their second bite at the apple. They get an opportunity to not only cross-examine the experts in this case for the prosecution, but they get a chance to also bring back those things um, regarding the expert that the expert said in the initial trial. So these also give more opportunities for the defense to cross-examine and poke those holes that may lead towards the reasonable doubt that, that we're all talking about. Yeah. Now, Adam, this is a very curious situation. We're hearing rumors that uh, we believe the closing arguments will be done in a brief, meaning in writing, as opposed to uh, the oral arguments we're so used to, to hearing. Uh, what are some of your thoughts when you hear that as a possibility to end this trial? Yeah, I mean, that's incredibly rare, and uh, I would not like it. I would not be happy about that at all. Uh, I love the closing argument. My entire trial strategy is to get in, get what I need, and get out in order to give myself that final argument and the ability to make those arguments and to do so in a style that we've all spent you know, our career cultivating. Um, how it translates on paper, 
is is tricky. Now, the flip side of that is you have someone reading it. So if you are going to give an hour, hour and a half long cross-examination, which sometimes you do in a, in a really heavy case like this, maybe some things get lost. Maybe some things uh, get glossed over that you really wanted to make a highlight. So in a brief, you can focus on those things more and say, and, and you can even put them in bold, you know, listen, this is a big point. It's in bold letters. Look at this point right here. Uh, and so maybe you get more traction that way, but it's it's very different and uh, it would not personally be my choice really in any circumstance. Yeah. Now, of course, Julie, we as defense attorneys, we write motions, we do all arguments, but this is a weird muscle to flex in that your closing argument would be written. So a kind of similar question to you, when you first heard this, what was your reaction that closing arguments might be written instead of oral? I'm surprised, although I do wonder, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's more of a memo where they'll be able to include case law. And if they're able to include case law, then it does become more technical, like Adam's talking about, that, you know, is there is there other cases in which, you know, the, 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 the evidence was not um, sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt? And so it might be a combination of both when we're talking about writing a summation. Um, so my guess is that it's going to be more of a legal format motion with, you know, exhibits plus with um, case law. That is not the normal thing that you would do in front of a jury. Right. So the hope is, is that if and when this memo, as, as you're describing it, Julie, comes out, we will be able to read it, you'll be able to read it, and we can, of course, give that expert legal analysis that our viewers are so accustomed to hearing when they come to the Law and Crime Trial Network. But until then, it seems the defense has adjourned the case till Tuesday to put their case on, but we have to wait till after this. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Report, where we're continuing the case of Kelsey Thomas. Of course, that's continued from March of this year when the first trial occurred. This time around, it's a bench trial. Let's listen to the defendant's husband, Aaron Thomas, who testified in that first trial. When I got the first phone call, I was at the car wash. I was just hanging up the hose. Did you get a second phone call? Yes. And where were you at when you received that second phone call? When I received the second phone call, I was at Five Corners by McDonald's. So what if, were you on your way back from the car wash? Yes. And where were you going to? I was going to our home on James. And that second call was that from who was that? Kelsey. And what, um, what if anything, did Kelsey say during that phone call? From what I can recall, um, she was very upset. Um, the only thing I remember hearing on that phone call was Chloe's not breathing. And at that point, I threw the phone in the seat next to me and went as fast as I could home. Did you then go home to your house, um, James? Yes. And when you arrived there, what did you observe? When I went to turn on the street, there was about half a dozen squad cars, um, two fire trucks and an ambulance, loads how, of people. I'm sorry. You're fine. Sorry. How, um, how long, if, if you can tell us or estimate, did it take from when you received that second phone call till you went and turned down your block and saw all this? Not very long. <laughs> I'd say from when I received the second phone call until I got to my street, maybe two minutes. All right, so just to remember, this witness may not have testified in the bench trial, but a lot of the testimony and testimony like this was adopted into the second trial based on a stipulation from both parties. So we've got to think about it in its entirety. Um, Adam Conta, we're listening to different members of the family speak. This is the defendant's own husband. Uh, do you see how the prosecution is maybe pulling out a potential motive of a mother who didn't want her child and resorted to the murder of her child? Do you see that there? Not really, from what we just showed. Um, you know, I understand that that's where we're going, but uh, but but no, I mean, I, you know, I don't see a really argument uh, an argument coming from the testimony we just saw there at all.
Yeah. And, and Julie, of course, we're see, I think we've seen a cousin, we've seen a mother, and now we're seeing a father. I know that uh, I think both you and Adam agree the cousin damaging to the defendant, I think split opinion on the mother. The father, I agree with Adam, not much there as yet, but of course we're kind of building to that crescendo with all of these family members really saying this wasn't the best mother of the, uh, this wasn't the mother of the year uh, or anywhere close. Uh, how do you think her character is going to play into this bench trial? Well, keep in mind, I think that one of the things they're getting in regards to the father is that the father wasn't home when the crime happened. Um, because remember, it has to be a crime of opportunity and you have to rule out everybody else. There was a baby in the house. I don't think the baby did it. And so it's either the child or the mother. And so what this witness establishes is that the father, unless I missed it, um, that the father wasn't home um, during that period of time. Maybe, it, maybe I, I heard it wrong. Um, and so that that's fantastic evidence because now it only points in the direction of the mother. Um, in terms of the personality of the mother, I, I think it's more than the personality. It's a question of whether or not she had a motive to not want this child anymore. And so there, yeah, there's a difference between being angry at your child and being so angry and hateful that you kill your child and then frame it as though the child accidentally hurt themselves. Um, I think some of the evidence seems to be leaning towards the mother, you know, having that motive. Okay, let's uh, listen to a little bit more of the husband's testimony. This time around, it's on cross-examination. And when you received that call, that's when she had mentioned something about Chloe being in trouble and, and you uh, got panicked and hurried home, correct? Correct. Now, you said that a moment ago, um, at what point did you feel that Kelsey's demeanor seemed odd to you? Was that throughout all of this, or at the hospital, or afterward, or when? I first noticed it at the hospital. I didn't notice it any time before because I was in a very emotional state. Okay, and I believe you said that you were also interviewed by police for about seven hours, correct? Correct. You never raised any concerns about Kelsey's demeanor ever before, have you? No. Including in my deposition a couple months ago when you and I spoke? Correct. All right, so again, Adam, not a lot there in that little segment, but again, the defense is doing a job of getting that correct, getting that yes, so kind of guiding the witness where they want. Are they getting close enough to where they want, or are we looking for a little bit more here? And if we're all looking for a little bit more, what do you think is going to be necessary there to push the envelope for the defense? Well, I thought that was good because it got out that, okay, you're here now saying that you had these concerns. You didn't raise these concerns to the police in your seven-hour interview. You didn't raise these concerns to me when we spoke months ago. You know, I think that's effective. But it just goes to the larger point, and I think, again, sort of harking back to the questions of why are we doing a bench trial uh, right now versus a jury trial, I think that this is just leading to the argument, this is not a contest to see who the mother of the year is. No one is up here saying she was a great mother. No one is up here saying that she was the most loving, nurturing uh, mom out there. But that's not what this trial is about. This trial is about one simple question. Did she murder her child? And all this other stuff, although you can put it towards motive, is really noise in terms of what the actual evidence shows. So, you know, I, I don't see anything that's going to move the needle one way or the other with the husband right now. Um, but I think, it's, you know, the prosecution is going to use this to build up, continue on their argument that there is motive and that shows why she did this. And the defense is going to say... That's that's besides the point. That's besides the point. The evidence shows that there is a reasonable doubt in how this child died. All right. So, Julia, kind of look into your crystal ball for me down to the future. We know the prosecution, uh, they haven't rested yet, but they said they're done with their witnesses. The defense has their expert on on Tuesday to give, obviously, their view of, of this medical uh, testimony. Sorry. Um, how do you think the rest of this trial will play out? And do you see an advantage from one or the other based on the procedures of bench trial, new, new testimony from this, from this uh, medical examiner, and that basically it being it? 
I don't think that it's going to be a whole lot different with regards to what the medical examiner has to say. I don't think there's going to be some big epiphany aha moment. I think it's going to be similar to the last one. And again, I, I am very curious if the judge is considering any lesser included, um, because if she is, um, then that might be the, the way um, to give both sides something. Um, I, I, you know, again, I hate to say that um, cases work this way, but they do. Um, maybe not in that jurisdiction, but they do in a lot. Um, you know, and so I it, look, the judge has a lot to think about uh, in terms of whether or not this case was made out, obviously, again, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, to your point about the lesser included, Julie, uh, do you think the judge, well, I, I would hope the judge would preface that and maybe say that early on, because if they are considering the lesser included, that would be really strange to me as to why the defense opted for a bench trial, because that would leave the judge with a very probably wide berth as to what she could potentially find uh, the defendant guilty of here. Do you think uh, that would have been discussed prior to, though? So, again, it depends on what, uh, what we're talking about in terms of the prior trial and what, what the breakup was. If it was 11 to 1 to convict, then I'm guessing that the defense counsel is praying that the judge gives a lesser included, um, because they're hoping that the judge will go down, um, you know, thinking that the judge is going to find her guilty of something. And so that would be a good thing for the defense versus, you know, the other way, if it was 11 to 1, the other way in which they're probably saying, no, we just want the murder one. We don't want the jury considering any, uh, the jury, the judge considering anything else. All right. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, Julie, Adam, I know you guys got busy days. I want to thank you very much for coming here on the Law and Crime Trial Network and lending us your expertise and opinions on this case. We're obviously going to continue to watch this case but we've got Linda Kenny Bodden coming up next. She's going to take over and she's going to dive deep into this case, exploring all of the ins and outs with her legal background. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you guys later.